Okay, so this video is going to be a video where I discuss the topic of gluttony, which is a topic I feel under-taught on in Bible churches, and it needs to be explored, I believe, so I'm digging into it. Don't give it a count for being an idolater. Speaking Idol of wheelchair guy, okay. That guy looked like he was maybe too fat to walk, that's why I was in wheelchair. Quick editor's note, I'm not referring to Kerrigan Skelly when I say a guy in a wheelchair that looks like maybe too fat to walk. I'm referring to somebody that was thrown previously and I'm now entering into a discussion about that concept. That kind of brings me to the topic of gluttony. I want to know more about gluttony. Can you tell someone they're committing gluttony? Or is that insensitive? We tell people, you're in sin for committing adultery, but we're not allowed to tell somebody they're committing gluttony. One who eats voraciously, very hungry, having a huge appetite, very eager, excessively eager, insatiable, hmm. ravenous. Does that mean like you just eat really fast? Piggish, ravenous, swinish, rapacious, greedy. What if you eat just really slow and laid back but just non-stop? I mean you can eat slow lettuce leaves all the time pretty much without stopping and still be thin. Are you still glutton? I'm having a hard time really defining this from a moral standpoint. It's like, okay, if somebody hasn't eaten for three days, are they going to like eat faster and more eagerly? Yeah. Is that then a sin of gluttony? Should they just still eat slow even though they're starving? I'm really struggling on this. I'm just going to be frank. When I see people who are obese, it kind of seems to lend to the argument that they would be a gluttonous person, right? And to the elders, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He does not obey us. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Well, if we compare gluttony with food to drunkardness with alcohol... Wouldn't that just mean to excess, if this is meant to be a comparison? Like, like they drank wine back then, presumably. So, he drinks wine, but not like everyone else, like slowly, and then just a couple a couple glasses, and then they're done, and it's low alcohol content wine from Bible days. It wasn't like today's wine that has 20% alcohol. It, it only had like half a percent. So, you know, he has a, a glass or two, drinking slowly at a good pace, doesn't ever get buzzed or anything are very mildly buzzed, but not to the point of being unsober-minded or drunk. And then, as far as a glutton, same thing, just eating so fast and drinking wine so fast that he gets drunk and eats way too much to the point where he'd gain weight if he does that all the time. Presumably, if you're sitting around a table and one guy takes like all the food eats it so fast, they get more food than everyone else then that would be like eating in a greedy way where everyone's not getting as much food as they would like because one guy is a glutton. So it would be like, pace yourself and eat just your portion to make sure enough can go around. I could see that. But it's like, what if you're eating by yourself in your bedroom? Can you still commit gluttony then? Is there any too fast or too slow? Is it really a speed issue? Well, surely it must be a matter of the heart, right? Does it just mean you're greedy when it comes to food? What if you're not greedy when it comes to food? You're very generous and you give away a lot of food. But you still eat more calories than you need every day. And you become obese. Are you glutton then? Or just undisciplined that you can't stick to a diet? Is being undisciplined and not sticking to a diet to the point of becoming obese or morbidly obese a sin? Or just an indication of lack of maturity? Can there be a mature person in Christ who's obese? If he were really mature in Christ, wouldn't he lose weight when he noticed he's overweight? Wouldn't he have the self-discipline and self-control to do so? One of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control. Isn't that a lack of self-control? People say obesity is a disease, 
but I have to question, are they claiming you can't lose weight? Because I watch the show The Biggest Loser, they all lose the weight. Are people just lacking the discipline to do that? I have more questions than answers on this topic. Some part of me wants to say, if you're obese, you're sinning with food. You're eating to excess every day. That's why you're having so many extra calories that you're becoming obese to the point of harming yourself. You're not treating your body as a temple of the Lord. You're not taking good care of yourself. And so that's gluttony then. Even if you don't eat ravenously, per se, you're committing gluttony overall by allowing your health, your health to go to shambles and become morbidly obese or even obese because you're not taking good care of the body you, you were given. It probably means you need to do a lot more fasting. Do not join those who drink too much wine or gorge themselves on meat. For the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty and drowsiness will clothe them with rags. So we see oftentimes join this idea of drinking too much wine and gluttony. This reference to gorging on meat I don't believe is referring to meat necessarily specifically. You could insert cake there as well. The point is you're gorging yourself on food. Meat would be a more expensive food. So you're gorging yourself on expensive food. You're spending a lot of money. So there's a monetary aspect to this as well. And it highlights that monetary aspect in verse 21 where it says, will come to poverty. So this idea that you're drinking Texas and eating Texas, it's not a good use of funding. And you can actually burn up your money in drinking and eating to excess. It's not only the cost of the food or alcohol you're eating or drinking to excess that's going to cause a financial impact, but it's also the effect that has on your energy and your work output at being able to serve the Lord or work at full capacity at your job or start new businesses and run your home and be just being very productive like the ant. The Bible says, consider the ant. Consider these very voracious workers that are always moving and storing and gathering. They're very hard workers. And we're to emulate that or imitate that hardworking, good work ethic that ants demonstrate. That is difficult to do when you're eating to excess on a regular basis. You get very sluggish when you're overweight. It tires you down. Makes it harder to get out of bed. Your joints creak and ache. You're less motivated when you feel terrible. The same thing applies to alcoholism. If you're drinking to excess all the time, you can get less sober-minded. You don't have sobriety. And you could become lazy and just want to fool around and just do silly things. And just not make good use of your time. It can lead you into depression or overly good mood to where you just want to merry make and get into drunken revelry. So then you may not be serious enough to actually get some work done. And so both of those can have an impact on your actual production or productive output, which can then have a major impact on your finances in a long-term way, even beyond just the cost of those, of alcohol or food, those vices that if taken to excess our vices, um, even beyond just the cost of that, is the cost on your ability to earn money. And it's really not just merely a matter of earning money either. The Bible talks about not storing up your treasures on earth, but storing up treasures in heaven. You won't be earning heaven bucks if you're too lazy to go help the old woman cross the street or carry in the groceries to help out your dad who just got home with the groceries or whatever idea may come to you you're like, man, it, it'd be good to serve someone today in this capacity, oh, but I can't do it. I'm just feeling overweight and tired. I just ate a huge meal. I'm buzzed on alcohol. I'm, I'm too drunk to help out. I'm stumbling around. Whatever it is, these things can hinder you from being able to serve your neighbor and store up treasures in heaven by doing works unto the Lord by serving your neighbor. So that would lead you to a sort of spiritual poverty, lacking stored up hev uh, heavenly treasures. In a sense, you could say it's hard enough to deny your flesh and push forward and serve others when you're kind of feeling like, I don't really feel like it. You're already taking up your cross and 
following him by forcing yourself to do things you don't always want to do in service of others, putting yourself not first, but putting yourself last, considering others more highly than yourself, but you're adding even more handicap to that ability to just deny your flesh and do the right thing when you're putting yourself in a situation where you're eating too much, you're too full, or you're overweight, or you're always thinking about your next meal, and so you're not able to actually serve people on all the occasions you could have been because your focus was too much on food or alcohol, and you were consumed with that consumed with the over focus on that and doing that to excess both in frequency and volume so you're supposed to do things in moderacy if I'm to let my moderation be known to all men does walking around obese make my moderation known to all men when I'm declaring to the world I lack self-control and I eat to excess and caloric intake way beyond my body's needs. No, that's the complete opposite. That doesn't give a message to all men that I'm a moderate person. It's it's giving the message of the very opposite. Now, as we've said, maybe I just can't afford healthier food, and the food I can't afford is just fast food and McDonald's, so I'm kind of being thrust into being overweight by factors outside of my control right now. Something to that effect, you could potentially argue but that still shows a mishandling of money, which also shows a lack of wisdom. Um, unless if the Lord made you poverty-stricken um, as a test, and you're going through a test, but how long would such a test last? Would it last well into you becoming obese by having to eat lower-quality food? Probably unlikely. If you're walking according to the Spirit, I don't think you would go through such a tremendous test that you're now becoming obese because you can't afford even a reasonable diet and you just have to eat junk food all the time. That's more affordable. I find that to be just like a lame excuse at some point for you to become obese because of such an extreme circumstance, although I suppose it is theoretically possible. But the Bible says to flee the appearance of evil. So if most people are going to look at you and assume you lack self-control, you're probably a glutton, and you lack the discipline required to fast and pray often, you lack the discipline required to eat in moderation, and you appear to be a ravenous eater, or someone that lacks good judgment in choosing foods that are more healthy and not so high in calories and junk food that's going to put on weight empty calories. Now granted, Jesus himself was accused of being a wine-bibber and glutton. However, the Pharisees were just looking to trap him with anything. It was a false accusation. And basically they were just saying, it just seems like you guys don't fast as much as some of the Pharisees or some of John's disciples. Um, and Jesus just responded, well, they're going to be fasting, basically but not while the bridegroom's with them. Now's the time to be more so in a state of celebration and joy, seeing all these wonderful miracles taking place. We'll save the fasting and prayer and just the suffering of just dealing with persecution and the difficulties of this life. We'll save a lot of that deep longing prayer and stuff for when um, the Son of Man has ascended and he's not among us kicking butt. And we're now, you know, a lot worse off for it because he, he would make things a lot better having him around. When there's a storm, he just tells the storm to be calm. I mean, he was the ultimate traveling companion, that's for sure. So they were to do more so the fasting and, not fasting and prayer, they're to pray always. But more so the fasting, which is to not eat food was to come more so after Jesus died and resurrected and left the disciples. So that was their reasoning for not doing a whole lot of fasting or abstaining from wine at that time. But to go on to say that Jesus and the twelve disciples were drunkards and full-on gluttons, clearly that was a false accusation. There's no way that's even conceivable. And I would say most people agree with this. When we, Whenever we see Jesus depicted in movies or whatever, we don't see him 
200 pounds overweight, we see him uh, very much of an athletic build, not fat at all. And I don't believe anybody could say that they can honestly picture Jesus being just a real fat guy. So clearly these Pharisees were just trying to pluck some kind of accusations out of nowhere just because they saw them eating decent sized meals on a semi-regular basis. It's just a ridiculous false accusation. If you're conveying all these messages, this is a lot of negative messaging you're bringing, so then you're not really fleeing the appearance of evil, even if maybe your intentions weren't bad, maybe you just lack knowledge. Well, the Bible says my people perish for lack of knowledge, so really you need to get educated on how to take better care of yourself, educated on how to manage your money so that you can get the proper foods that may cost a little more, etc., so that you're not perishing, you're not leading people astray, you're not leading a life that's a foolish life, where you're dying of obesity or whatever, or you're not fully carrying out your full capacity as a person because of your lack of proper diet and nutrition, not treating your body as a temple of the Lord, etc., you're then not doing the best you could be doing because of lack of knowledge. So really, you should educate yourself in order to be able to do these things the best you possibly can. We have the internet, we have a wealth of information available. There's really no excuse to be completely ignorant on these very basic things. And eating to excess is not eating in moderacy. And all of that excess bears forth evidence of itself in weight gain. You are consuming more calories than you're spending, is the bottom line. And so you are consuming calories to excess for your body's needs. That's indisputable. That's science. So if you're fat and if you're getting to be obese, you are eating to excess. There's a lot of food that's entering you that didn't need to be going to you because you already have more than enough calories and you're going over your calorie need. So that is excess. Even if it's just a little bit of excess per meal, there's a net excess over the course of many meals being put on display by your gross obesity. So we're starting to get down to some of what the Bible is trying to teach about gluttony here. Even though there's no explicit definition, we're starting to piece together the clues here. So really, we should be ashamed if we find ourselves severely over the weight that we ought to be to the point where we're becoming unhealthy because of it, and it's starting to hold us back from being able to carry out our daily function, being able to walk, being able to serve others. You're actually putting food higher than as an idol than serving others if you're eating to the point where you're not able to serve others at your full capacity. Not only that, but all this extra money you're spending on large amounts of food that you don't need or large amounts of alcohol that you don't need in the case of a drunkard, that money could have been used to give to others who are in need. So you're instead spending it on your own selfish, fleshly, carnal desires to just gorge yourself on food on a regular basis. Or we could define it as eating significantly more food than your body actually requires on a regular basis. Now, there is a bit of a nuance to this because oftentimes more inexpensive food is less good for you, higher in calories, but they're lousy calories. So somebody could be eating larger amounts of food but barely getting the nutrients they need and gaining weight while still being almost starving because they're not getting the necessary vitamins and nutrients. So a poor family that's eating trash quality food like McDonald's every day, you could see yourself gaining weight and yet still be starving for certain nutrients. So that does add a twist to the whole thing, especially on the economic side of the whole equation that has to be taken into consideration. This is why we have to be careful not to judge by outer appearances. God judges the heart, and so there are factors we may not completely be weighing in. But it goes without saying that if you take a multivitamin, um, I take mature multi-Kirkland signature 
vitamins and minerals at 400 tablets, it's like 30 bucks for like a like a year, year and a half supply. You just take one of those a day, you're going to be getting the vitamins and nutrients you need to a point, and then your meals then aren't so necessary to get each and everything in its full daily value, vitamin and mineral wise. And then you don't have to get the premium, very best meals, since we know our food is pretty depleted nowadays with the poor farming practices that are on, that are being used. It's pretty nutrient depleted food we get oftentimes, unless if we're buying really high end organic foods, for example. Is it a sin if you gorge yourself on Thanksgiving turkey on Thanksgiving day? Eating to the point where you're in pain? Because I I grew up where that's what everybody did. They always ate till they're in pain. I actually stopped doing that because I realized it wasn't worth it. I was like, okay, the food tastes good, but then I'm in pain for like two hours. I might as well just eat till I'm full or I'm not going to be in pain. So I stopped doing that. I felt almost pressured to eat till I'm in pain because that was like the big joke. We all eat till we're in pain on Thanksgiving. But I just realized one day when I was a kid, like, this is actually really stupid. Why am I going to eat till I'm in pain? I stopped doing it. Oh! And hence... The glutton is one who is a prodigal. They waste their means by indulgence. Is not our body a gift from the Lord? You waste it away, squandering it. Not taking good care of the gift you've been given, your inheritance. As a human being, you're given one body. You squander it. You're a debaucher, a waster of your own body. Okay, then, anyone that's obese to the point where it's damaging their health is squandering, as a prodigal son, their inheritance of their own body. So then that is gluttony. According to this... That's that. I like that definition. I mean, we had no definition. What I mean by that is there was no Old or New Testament writer that explicitly defined the word gluttony in no uncertain terms. Just explicitly writ out a whole definition. That's not in there. But we can piece together the clues as I've been doing here. As a church, I've never been taught a definition, but this, this rings true to me. So if you are obese... Or significantly over. I mean, if it's plus or minus 7 to 10 pounds, you look basically trim. If you're wearing a jacket, you can't tell you have a gut. That's one thing. But if you got a big, big gut, you're at high risk for heart disease. You're breathing hard going up the stairs. Very minor physical activity you can hardly handle. You're in pain all the time because your body wasn't designed to carry the amount of weight you're carrying then you are debauching, you're a prodigal, you're debauching and wasting away your own body because of lack of self-control with food and poor decision-making. You're squandering your body as a prodigal son. Therefore, you're given to eating. You are gluttonous. You are eating to excess. Again, unless, of course, there's some underlying health condition or financial condition outside of your control that you're actively attempting to address and your weight got away from you for a time or you're a pregnant woman and this is a natural part of the birth process or the pregnancy process. Um, obviously, there are going to be exceptions. I'm speaking in generality here, so take that in mind. You have a daily caloric need every day or most days the majority of days, you're eating well in excess of that caloric need to your own detriment of your own health. Then that is gluttony. So we can say that anyone that is su substantially overweight is committing gluttony. They're in sin. They need to repent. They need to lose the weight. 
The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proven right by the her deeds. You can't say someone that's a hundred pounds overweight is wise. I mean, they might be wise in certain areas, but on that decision, whatever lack of self-control, whatever oversight led them to that point, and they're not dealing with the problem, they're not being wise with that with their body. They're squandering their body and their health. They're going to cause long-term health damage, potentially putting themselves in an early grave. And they can do something about it. They can eat one meal a day. That's what I do. I eat one meal a day. All right, correction. I make one meal a day. I call it the only meal of the day because I have one snack a day as well. Sometimes two snacks, but that's on rare occasion. So pretty much I eat around 3 to 5 p.m. my one meal and it's usually a significant meal because it's my one meal so I'm significantly hungry um, it's probably like two meals for most people and then around let's say 9 or 10 p.m. I'll have my snack which is fruit I buy frozen fruit in bulk and I eat fruit at night as my snack. That's in place of ice cream or junk food or whatever, which on rare occasion I may have some junk food at that time of night instead of the fruit. If it's leftovers from some get-together or whatever, I may have that. But predominantly I have fruit because that's way more healthy. And buying fruit in bulk and putting it in the deep freezer, you can store it so you only have to buy it like once every quarter, every fiscal quarter. And you don't have to think about it. You just grab your bag of fruit for the night you can have fruit and you don't really have to be too careful about eating too small of an amount um, I probably have like two fistfuls like the size of my fist times two so that like the equivalent of maybe three apples worth of fruit and so it's a it's a fairly significant amount but I don't really call it a meal because it's just fruit and I consider a meal to be like meat and potatoes bread like actual heavy foods whereas this is kind of like my ice cream alternative it's just like a cold sweet snack that's healthy much healthier than um, junk food or whatever and so the system that I've developed for myself of just having the one meal a day and then the one snack a day has has made it so much easier for me to maintain my weight though I live a semi sedentary lifestyle although that's it even in that is in season sometimes I'm more active on my feet than others but I go through seasons where I'm relatively sedentary and I really don't burn off a whole lot of calories so this really throttles how much calories I'm going to be pulling in whereas if you're eating several meals a day it's a lot harder to manage because you may just go over your caloric needs and just eat more than you need to and you do that one or two meals a day and that's going to start adding up but if you only have the one meal a day it's a lot easier to undershoot even your calorie limits um, it can be easily done if you just happen to not eat a huge meal, you uh, interrupt the meal abruptly early or whatever, or you just run out of food available because you're eating leftovers and you just didn't have that much and you just say, oh well, I'm kind of full. And you don't actually eat till you're really full. Um, so those things can happen. Or you forget your evening dessert snack and so you miss a meal here or there. And then obviously fasting is a factor as well. You should um, fast from time to time for fasting and prayer in order to develop your spirit man and grow in the Lord so or to petition God on something um, the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective so sometimes when you fast and pray you're gonna really be getting God's attention um, like the unjust judge you ask frequently and you fast you show God your earnestness and your diligence on this prayer then he may um, actually grant the prayer and he teaches us to do this to pray earnestly and diligently and to pray more than once if it's something we're really strongly desiring but we want to make sure we're praying about things that aren't selfish or wicked or something like that we want to be giving selfless prayers that are wholesome prayers and good things also I'd like to note that I have a significantly slow metabolism I believe it's very, very easy for me to put on weight. I'm not just lucky genetically, and yet I've been able to maintain a pretty healthy level of weight, in my opinion. 
Um, also, I do this without living a, a very active lifestyle for the most part, relatively speaking, and I do not, for quite some time, even have a gym membership and work out. There's been one or two instances where I visited a gym or did some exercise over the past couple of years, but that's about it. So then my only major physical activity is actually through physical labor, through work, through being productive in ways that save money or make money or serve others. So kingdom bucks is another way of making money, treasure in heaven style money. So those are the ways I get my exercise, and that's the ways that are ideal to get exercise as opposed to a gym membership, which is okay, but it's not ideal because you're not putting forth that productivity in ways that will actually benefit someone, whether it's your own family or somebody else with the economic means you're gaining through your work or through kingdom bucks or whatever it is. You're not getting that when you get your work out through a gym. You're just actually spending money to give it to the gym. So you're not gaining that return on this investment of calories and effort that you put in on the gym, except for obviously health or whatever, but you're not gaining the return of kingdom bugs. You're not gaining the return of, I mean, unless if you're there witnessing at the gym or whatever. I mean, obviously the Lord can see your heart. You could be doing good at the gym too. So I'm not saying the gym is wicked or whatever, but it's less than ideal because you'd be better off doing something where you're making money or saving money or serving somebody physically through labor of some sort. Okay, so we're to be doers of the word and not hearers only. I'm sharing with you guys how I'm practicing what I preach, so to speak, how I'm not practicing gluttony, I'm not struggling with my weight, and I'm exercising discipline and wisdom when it comes to my diet and my health and my weight situation and my caloric management and nutritional management. I'm giving you examples. I'm not boasting in myself. The Bible says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. That's what Paul said. So any teacher should be practicing what they preach or else they're a hypocrite. If I were here saying you guys shouldn't be overweight, but I myself was overweight, or you guys should be careful with your money, or you guys should do this or that, and I'm horrible with my money, and I'm horrible on this or that, then I'm being a hypocrite. So I'm sharing this in order to set a good example and not be a hypocrite and also to give hope for people who really are confused about where they should move forward in these areas I'm saying here are solutions I came up with here are practical applications of things the Bible's teaching so that I can give somebody some ideas some steps on how they might be able to resolve some of these issues in their life that may they may be getting convicted about for the first time because this is a teaching not often taught in churches because it can be too sensitive of a topic and so I'm boldly going into these sensitive topics. I have no fear of man. I fear God alone. And I believe that he wants these things to be taught in order to have his people not perish for lack of knowledge. I don't have a big salary from a church I'm worried about might be in trouble from the fat congregation that gives me my paycheck. All right, so the Bible says in John 10:11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, which is like the pastor that's all about just getting paid, and he'll keep the truth from you if it's an offensive truth, potentially could be taken offense of, or it's a sensitive topic, so he'll avoid that to make sure he gets that paycheck. The hired hand is not the shepherd, and the sheep are not his own. When he sees the wolf coming, any topic that could threaten his paycheck and ruffle some feathers in the church, he abandons the sheep and runs away to preserve himself. Then the wolf pounces on the sheep, people dying of obesity because they were never taught about gluttony, and scatters the flock. So this man runs away because he is a hired servant and is unconcerned for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I laid my life I lay down my life for the sheep. Any good teacher of the Word of God has to have this attitude, has to imitate Jesus in this area. They have to be willing to talk about the hard topics and things that may offend some. Do so with as much tact as they can, that's fine. But they can't be worried about people becoming convicted of sin or of some things that they need to improve on in their life that hasn't been yet 
revealed to them as a sin. They were innocent in it, but it's not pleasing to God. And so if they continue to do it after feeling convicted from the Holy Spirit, now it becomes a sin. So, or a willful sin, as opposed to a sin that's not counted or not imputed. Blessed is the man whose sins are not counted against them. Because they did it in innocence. They didn't know. So now I'm letting you guys know this could be a problem. Some of these areas we're talking about. So all of that to say, I have never in my life, going to church for over 30 years, heard a pastor give a sermon about gluttony or even mention it. The G word's off limits. Ask yourself, are these pastors hirelings? Why aren't they bringing up this horrible, horrible pandemic of gluttony or pandemic of obesity born out of potential gluttony that's plaguing this country? Ask yourself that. Are they hirelings? Are they afraid to bring up something that could affect their paycheck? Um, that'd be something worth challenging your local pastor of your local church to actually do a message on seeing if he's really hireling or if he's going to boldly declare the truth on these topics and look into this and actually prepare a sermon for you. So I can say, yeah, being fat can be a problem in the sight of God and in your ability to carry out your function as a Christian, walk as Jesus walked, that can actually be a hindrance. So here are some ways where that can be a hindrance. Here are some biblical backings for that. I don't have to worry about then losing my paycheck or whatever, getting thrust out of my church. So I can be bold without worry about self-preservation so sometimes pastors can be a bit compromised of self-interest I don't have to worry about that as somebody that's just sharing teachings online although even if I were the head of a church I would hope that I'd be equally bold and share the truth without compromise because of selfish self-preservation motives and financial reasons now, some days I'll eat more, some days I'll snack throughout the day and then just skip my main meal. I'll just have some small snacking throughout the day and I even have a caloric deficit. I'll skip dinner if I snacked a little too much. But generally, I'll just fast the whole day and eat one big meal at dinner time. I've found that's kept my weight very much under control. Now, there are some ebbs and flows. If my dad starts buying like coffee cake or something for me that he knows I like, I might splurge on that, or Dairy Queen, I might splurge. I'll make exceptions here and there. But generally, day in and day out, I'll try to eat one meal a day and then just have fruit for dessert and just drink water. And I'm managing my weight well, despite a relatively very sedentary lifestyle compares with how active a farmer would be or somebody that works with their hands all day, aggressive physical labor. And so, I know it's possible to maintain your weight. And I don't have some naturally super fast metabolism. I can gain weight very easily. If I ate three or four meals a day, substantial meals, and had my lifestyle, I would gain like 10 pounds every two weeks. I could gain 20 pounds a month, probably. And so, I'm not specially gifted. That's what, what obese people say is, Anyone that's not obese, it's because you don't have to deal with what I have to deal with. My body gains weight easier than you. I don't think that's necessarily true. It sounds like just a excuse to me. All right, so anyways, after looking into the evidence, guys, if something's a sin, we want to know about it, right? Yes. Do I hate fat people? No. I just want to have a, an excuse to judge them. <laughs> No, that's not it. I just want to know what is gluttony because it's considered a sin, is it not? I mean, the Catholics for sure think it's a sin. In Christianity, gluttony is considered a sin if the excess desire for food causes it to be withheld from the needy. Okay, that's a horrible example. So you're telling me, as long as the needy are fed by food clinics, I can just go full ham and weigh, I could weigh a thousand pounds and I haven't sinned. And I can eat like a whole pig and a turkey for every meal. That is a stupid definition. I'm just going to tell it straight like it is. We all can agree that that's a immature, wicked definition. Gluttony seems to be a sin that Christians like to ignore. I agree with that and I'm trying to stop that. We don't want to ignore sin. We want to expose sin 
and repent of it. That's the purpose of this. I'm not hating fat people. It's sharpening one another. As iron sharpens iron, I'm looking to sharpen, to edify, to help the church clean up their act. How can the church get the respect from the world as as modeling walking as Christ walked if we're 500 pounds overweight? That's not how Christ would walk. Are you kidding me? That's ridiculous. Imagine Jesus being like 800 pounder. They would have need they would have needed to get like three crosses strapped together or else he'd snap it in half. The cross wouldn't be able to hold him. I'm going to bring up smoking here since it's mentioned here. Drinking to excess is a sin. Smoking I believe is a sin because it's damaging to your body, to your lungs. Not to mention the secondhand smoke is damaging to people around you. Some people die from secondhand smoke. So ask yourself, is breathing secondhand smoke into your home, like my dad does on a daily basis, um, doing good unto your neighbor, doing as you'd have them do unto you, if literally 41,000 adults per year in the United States die of secondhand smoke exposure, does that sound like something you do that is good for your neighbor, putting them at risk of death because of your vice? I mean, even if the risk of death is very low, it's still there, and the health effect is never going to be positive. It's going to be negative, even if death is an extreme case of the effects of it. Now, my dad's a heavy smoker. And he won't admit it's a sin. He won't even admit. He's so in denial. He says he doesn't believe it's bad for your health. He thinks that's overrated. Talk about someone just lying to themselves. So now that's adding lying to the list of sins. Just to support it. Because he, he delights in it. It's very carnal. So if smoking's a sin. Because it's bad for your body. So also should obesity be a sin. Now. There can be people like an NFL player who who pack some extra fat, but they're big guys. Let's look at like a healthy NFL offensive lineman. Okay, so this guy, he's got fat, like he's got a gut, but it's just a little bit past his belt. He's got so much muscle. He looks strong, very physically capable, still can run fast, still can lift heavy weights, still very functional. I don't think he's an unhealthy guy. I would think he's a very healthy guy. He can probably sprint faster than me. And yet he's got some substantial weight in the midsection. So I'm not saying you can't have any fat. In fact, women tend to have more fat than men naturally. Same with this guy. You know, he's got some belly. So I'm not talking about this. I'm talking about like, like even this, That that's healthy. This is starting to borderline into now getting unhealthy. When it starts folding over and just getting that big, I, I know he's sticking it out, but this is getting that to the point now. See, I, I would say that's getting into gluttony at that point. Unless if he just ate and it just does that right after he ate a huge meal. This is for sure gluttony. Or more accurately said, looks like it's pointing to gluttony. While we don't actually know for sure if there's some underlying health condition or financial problem where it's just impossible to avoid or something. Theoretically, maybe it's possible, I'm not a doctor, but it's pointing to that. It would be a definite red flag. Okay, so if you're doing something that's going to lessen your the length of your life and it's going to make you incapable of serving others because you're so low on energy because you're just so overweight. It's just exhausting and painful to, to get out of bed. Then you are squandering the body you've been given. That That's a real prodigal son. And you have pastors doing this. It's a bad example to the flock. I know we've got more fattening food nowadays, blah, blah, blah. So that means you have to fast a lot more. Eat one meal a day like I've been doing. Or you can eat all the meals during the day, like they say, the experts say, eat, eat like six or seven meals a day, but very small. And count your calories and all that stuff. But that's tedious, distracting, takes a ton of work, takes a ton of discipline, annoying. I'd rather just eat one meal and call, and call it. 
that's a lot simpler. You just have one meal prep. You have to decide what to eat one time, make one good decision, and then have fruit for breakfast or fruit for um, dessert. And it also forces you to actually fast, which is very healthy to do intermittent fasting. And um, during that time, your body gets used to it. You don't, you're not even hungry after you get used to that, doing that. And you don't have to worry about eating then. Your body's not hungry. Your body's used to not eating during a certain time frame. And so it's less distractions. And you can just stick with whatever you're supposed to be doing. It's a lot more productive, a lot more practical, a lot more efficient. So that's why I recommend everyone that has any type of weight issues, just eat one meal a day. Have fruit for dessert. And you can stretch out the meal because you can enjoy food. So what I recommend is eat one meal slowly. When you only eat one meal, you're allowed to eat more, too, depending on your body size and whatever. You can eat a substantial big meal, because it's only the one meal. And you can eat it slowly. Eat it for 45 minutes. Just a nice, slow meal. Chew thoroughly. Enjoy the meal. Thank the Lord for the meal. And then you can have family time during that, or you can be doing something edifying during eating like listening to sermons or listening to audio bible or whatever while you eat and then you can slowly eat fruit a lot of it as your dessert and that could be for another half hour to an hour just really slowly eating it you can eat like a pound or two of fruit I think and so That's my advice to stop being a glutton. Now, one thing I appreciate about the Catholics, because I know the Catholics believe some things I'm against, one thing I appreciate is the depth they go into on defining sin for us. That's a blessing from the Lord that they do that. And they define things as mortal sins and deadly sins and all this stuff. And it's really helpful. And I've seen a lot of wisdom in the way they go through it. Gluttony was regarded as a crucial sin as it could trigger others. However, it could be either a mortal or venial sin, depending on the severity of intent and the context in which the sin was committed. The appreciation and excessive pursuit of good food were not exempt of sin. See, I agree with that too. I think food can become an obsession where every meal has to be some epic cheese-covered crazy thing. Sometimes your meal should not be based on tasting so good and so pleasurable. Yeah, sometimes a meal can be very pleasurable, but a lot of meals should not be that pleasurable. It's like, have a sober mind wear sackcloth and ashes you live in a wicked country a wicked time of the world we might be in the seven year period right now and you're going to obsess over giant triple cheeseburgers covered in bacon and it's like calm down calm down with all that not every meal needs to be some crazy concoction so fattening so pleasurable your eyes roll back in your head right now i'm eating as a snack because like I said, some days I do snacking um, and then just don't eat a big dinner. I'll just very mildly snack if I'm just like relaxing, not doing anything that day. Sometimes I just eat a small amount out of boredom. Plus yesterday I didn't eat dinner. I just had a little bit of snacking. I was at a huge caloric deficit yesterday, so today I'm more hungry. So I'm almost forcing the snacking a little more today. I'm just eating organic raisin cereal gluten-free, delicious and excellent source of omega-3. It's off-brand raisin cereal with mostly just really dry cereal flakes that are super hard with no flavor. There's not even sugar on the raisins on this brand. Raisin brand has at least sugar on the raisins. This has no, th no flavor at all except natural flavors. So this is not like some incredibly like delicious crazy good 
meal or anything like that. This is just like a boring. No, please, I said I'm eating this. Every time I bring up food, or eat food, I have these poppers holding out cups. Look at th this is gluttony. No, it's not. So... I think somebody could be committing gluttony not knowing it. The Bible says that he that knows to do good and does not do it, for him it is sin. So I think a lot of people have been committing gluttony not realizing it. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is a sin. That's James 4.17. So for the person that knows that letting their self go and gain a hundred pounds overweight is a bad move and it's going to be killing them prematurely it's going to be preventing them from having the energy and get up and go to help others and serve people it's going to make them lazy it's going to make them depressed it's going to throw off their chemicals it's going to just be a huge hindrance in their life if they know that what they're doing is going to cause that and they do it anyways, then that for them, it's a sin. But, if the weight just crept on, up on them over the years, they were actually lied into believing that it was unavoidable. And they really did try a lot of diets and they all didn't work out. Then, I'm not saying necessarily it's a sin for them. It's It, it may be a technically a sin to have let yourself go like that. But it won't be counted against you if you were ignorant that you had a choice and it was possible to overcome this. And God, by God... We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. So if they weren't really th applying that to their diet and to taking good care of their body, then it may not be counted against them as sin. But once you know it's wrong, now you're held to that. So for those listening to this and me pointing out that this is not good, if you then, through unbelief, deny that Christ can give you victory in this area, and you continue to overeat and not take care of yourself and continue to put on pounds and put yourself in an early grave, then for you it would be sin if you can see clearly what I'm showing now. Okay, so to back up what I'm saying, that if you can see clearly, number one, that it's bad to um, not take good care of the body God has blessed you with, that that's a squandering of a gift you've been given, and you can also see that you're not some victim or it's, you're, you have no control of this. Um, and you actually can overcome this problem by the power of Christ. Unless if that is impossible in your case. Theoretically, could that be possible? As I said, I'm not a doctor. Also, um, I mean, I feel like there can <laughs> generally be exceptions to things that we just haven't even thought of or aren't clearly aware of. But as a general rule, I'd say the majority of people can overcome this. And it's really a self-control matter more than anything. But some medical issue or some financial issue that's just making it impossible for this season or what have you, um, sure. But you can probably work out of that, get healthier, get healing, either supernaturally or combination using um, different medicines or natural healing remedies, whatever it is, get your health back, get your finances back in order, and then address it. But just to use that as an excuse, well, I got this medical problem, that's never going to go away. It's possible that you could push through that, through vitamins, exercise, whatever it is, to get healthy again. The body can heal, whether it's through supernatural healing or some type of natural healing. Um, so anyways... If you can see these things, these truths, and yet you continue to defiantly then stick with falling deeper and deeper into obesity, not addressing it, at that point you could be entering into sin. And God's going to judge according to the heart. Man can only judge by outer appearances, but by outer appearances it's not looking good at that point. Um, and some support for this idea of you being able to see the truth and see and get convicted 
um, it crossing into sin at that point is John 9.41. It says, If you were blind, Jesus replied, you would not be guilty of sin. So in other words, if you had no idea that you really ought to keep your weight at a healthy level and you should take good care of your body, it never occurred to you, then you would not be guilty of sin in this area. Or if you were blind, you had no idea that you could lose weight if you applied yourself or got healthy or took certain steps or that there is ways you can reduce caloric intake to match your body's needs rather than give more calories than you need. If you didn't know about that, you never looked into it or just had your head in the sand your whole life, whatever, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. You didn't know. You were innocent because you didn't have the information. But, since you claim you can see, your guilt remains. So, if you're able to see, and you know right from wrong, in other words, the law has been given to you, you have been made aware of a moral issue that's at hand. You have been taught about gluttony and about the ways you can address um, some of these outward signs that potentially you could be entering into gluttony. Um, and yet you continue in your current path, not making the changes that you know you ought to make, then your guilt remains. You would be guilty of sin at that point. Um, and your conscience were, will bear witness against you when you face God. So if you don't listen to your conscience, then you're going to be in big trouble with God. So if your conscience is starting to prick you on some of the things I'm saying, then you need to act big time. Because that's that conscience is a gift from God that can help you to live a godly life. It's trying to give you a message then. And we also have the verse, To him who knows to do good, so you know you ought to make some change, and your conscience is telling you, but does not do it, so you ignore your conscience. You don't do the good you know you ought to do. To him then it is sin. So that's a confirmation. So sin is not just black and white rule based. It's also based on are you aware? Do you know what you're doing is wrong? God looks at that. He looks at your conscience bearing witness against you. Your conscience is what he judges you according to. If you genuinely have a clear conscience about it, deep down in your heart you think it's pure, then to the pure all things are pure would apply in that situation. But I would question though all things are permissible, not all things are beneficial. So, though your conscience may be clear, are you really doing what's most beneficial for your life with your current path? And most likely the answer is no, you need to change in this area. So there may be people that this is reaching, they never even consider that this could be bad. They've always been fat, their family's always been fat, everyone at their church is fat, and they just thought it's fine. But now they know. That's why we want to... Our, my people perish for lack of knowledge. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I shall also reject you. That you shall be no priest to me, seeing that you forgot the law of your God, I will also forget your children. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. People are dying with obesity being an epidemic. It's one of the leading causes of death. Obesity is a national epidemic and a major contributor to some of the leading causes of death in the U.S., including heart disease, stroke, diabetes, and some types of cancer. We need to change our communities into places that strongly support healthy eating and active living. This is from the CDC, Center for Disease Control. Now, they are a wicked group of people, I know that, but I agree with them on this point. So, Bible-believing Christians seeking to obey the Lord and please the Lord and demonstrate self-control, which is the fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. If you believe you're overweight and you set yourself to address the problem, and it is a problem, if it's going to cause cancer and heart disease, that's a problem. That's like putting the Lord to the test. That's like jumping off a cliff and saying, Lord, catch me with your angels. That's jumping off the weight cliff and saying, Lord, supernaturally extend my life. 
despite me being morbidly obese. That's putting the Lord to the test. And that is going to be supported by you saying, well, I just don't have control over this. Yes, you do. You have self-control. Well, correction, to say it more accurately, you have the ability to practice self-control, but you may not be doing so. And you can stop eating to excess. You can discipline yourself to stay on a healthy diet. You can discipline yourself to exercise and take good care of the body you've been given rather than squandering it like a prodigal son squandering their inheritance. Your body is one of your inheritances. It's a gift from the Lord. You should take good care of it. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. You should not sin against your own body. Now, that's normally referring to sexual sin, but I believe that anything you do against your own body is a bad thing to do. We want to take good care of our body to show God our appreciation for our body. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a man can commit is outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body. Is it glorifying God with your body and treating it as a temple of the Holy Spirit to lack self-control and pig out all the time and eat to excess on a semi-regular basis to the point where you're putting on excess fat all the time and you are, and by all the time I don't mean literally all, but overall, overarchingly, you are eating to excess if you're becoming obese and you're you are sinning against your own body by basically committing a slow suicide. Now again, that wording sounds very strong, but it's meant to drive home a point on the seriousness of the issue, that this really can be a fatal set of poor decisions. And though, as I said, it is a sin against the body in a sense, you may be ignorant of that sin, and so it's not held against you, your guilt does not stand, your conscience hasn't borne witness against you, etc. You may not be punished by God for it, but if you are convicted and you can see ways you can improve and you don't act on that, you don't do the good you know to do, then for you it becomes sin for sure, that's counted. And the same principle applies to smoking cigarettes. It's a sin against your own body because you're slowly committing suicide. You're putting the Lord to the test. So I'll say that more than anything, it's imperative that we educate other believers that they're, they shouldn't be doing self-harm by committing obesity against themselves. It is treatable through diet and exercise. Basically, your body burns a certain amount of calories and you need to eat less than the number of calories you burn in order to lose weight. If you eat more than the calories you burn, you gain weight. It's very simple. It's just basic math. So if you're becoming obese, it means you're not burning up as much calories as you're eating. You need to eat less. It's not rocket science. Or you can eat the same amount, but eat things that are lower in calorie content. Maybe higher in minerals and vitamins, lower in fats. But I highly recommend the show The Biggest Loser. It shows people that are morbidly obese lose the weight and get much better health as a result. And I recommend that for people. If they don't have the physicality to work off in such a dramatic fashion through exercise that fat, then have the discipline and self-control to do more fasting. Now, if you cannot fast and you're too sickly to exercise and you have lack of access to foods that would be able to give you the, the nutrients you need without so much of the fat, because maybe those foods are a little too, too, much, too costly for you, then you're now in a position where it's apparently too late for you to get out of your situation supposedly that may be the case for some people that there there is no solving it at that point and so we can't judge you for that but most people can do something about it still and i encourage them to do so that would please the lord for you to take better care of yourself also gluttony can be so gluttony can be a overarching pattern of behavior that culminates in obesity, which is a sin against your own body, or it can be a acute sin one-time thing where you eat in a very greedy, voracious way and commit sin in that moment. And we see an example of that, the quail and the plague. Okay, so they had just been complaining. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt, 
there we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. Each day the people will go out and gather enough for that day. And this way I will test whether or not they will follow my instructions. Okay, so then they got the manna. But then later they complained again regarding wanting meat. And on this particular event, a wind was sent by the Lord in response to all this. The Lord decided, okay, I'll give you guys meat. We're reading the Numbers version of this, but it's also written about an Exodus. Um, actually, we'll jump just straight to the Exodus one. Uh, okay, the Lord said, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them, at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. That evening quail came and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew on the ground, dew around the camp. When the layer of dew had evaporated, there were thin flakes on the desert floor, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they asked one another, what is it? Let's jump, let's jump back to Numbers. Alright, so they were complaining they wanted meat. And all that day and night after the Lord sent the quail, and all the next day, the people stayed up gathering the quail. No one gathered less than ten homers, and they spread them all out around the camp. But while the meat was still between their teeth, before it was chewed, the anger of the Lord burned against the people, and the Lord struck them with a severe plague. It seemed to me they were really greedily gathering up the quail was the issue. So that was like the gluttony, this like huge lust for meat. I want to bring up something else. Kerrigan Scully, who's a holiness preacher, street preacher, he, he teaches that we should live holy as Christians. He had a, a couple guys counter to him. Well, if you are obeying the Lord as you claim, why do you have this huge stomach here? This this huge gut of fat on your midsection. Huge. And he didn't have an answer. They said, this is gluttony, sir. He couldn't defend himself. He ended up just saying, well, supposing it is a sin, you're saying that we can sin as Christians. But but that didn't address their argument, which was this. You claim we can stop sinning as Christians, and yet here you are in sin with gluttony, proven by your huge gut. And he did not address their point, which made their point all the louder, the fact that he did not even attempt to stand firmly on his ground that, yes, I have stopped sinning, and I testify to that, then he would need to defend the gut. He would need to say, and I don't believe this gut is a sin, and it's not gluttony, and here's why. But he couldn't do that, or he wouldn't do that, or he thought his defense of his gut would have been too hollow, and he wasn't sure, and he thought, maybe it's true, maybe it is gluttony, I'm not sure. Um... In other words, if you bring a direct accusation or question to somebody and they resort to deflection as opposed to a direct answer, then you probably have caught them in some kind of error. And that's what seems to have been taking place here. But suffice to say, if you as a Christian want to walk in holiness, having a huge gut will cause at least some people to question, well, are you really obeying the Lord? Because if you were... Did the Holy Spirit lead you to continue having an enormous beer belly? Is that the life of a saint in Christ? Is that walking as Jesus walked in this life, having 50 pounds of fat on your midsection? I don't think Jesus walked that way. So it doesn't look good for you if you're telling people, I live holy, and walking around with a 50 pound beer belly. That doesn't look good. And he had no defense for it. And that's of great concern to me. If he believed it was okay and he could defend it, I'm, I'm willing to hear him out. But he didn't try. He didn't try. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Keeping a clear conscience so that those who slander you may be put to shame by your good behavior in Christ. Can you say that as a holiness preacher who carries 50 pounds of fat on their stomach and claims to be obeying the Lord with their life, that you are prepared to give an, a defense 
to those who ask about the hope that is in you, this hope that you have overcome the world, this hope that you are obeying the Lord, this hope that you are, in fact, walking as Jesus walked in this life, and that he is operating through you, and that you are denying the flesh and walking according to the Spirit, if you're claiming to be able, if you're prepared to defend that hope, then you need to defend all of your actions that you claim are in alignment with the Holy Spirit. But he couldn't. So he could not defend his actions of carrying 50 pounds of fat on his midsection. So is he keeping a clear conscience then? So that when they slandered him about his fat, he put them to shame by his good behavior. Was he doing the good behavior? And it didn't seem like it. Instead, he just got really loud and kept saying, well, so what if I'm committing gluttony? You said I can commit gluttony and still go to heaven. Well, so what if I'm sinning? You say I can sin and still go to heaven. That's a terrible response. Who cares what they say in this regard? You're telling me you live holy. That you have gone forth and sinned no more. That you're obeying the Lord. That you're perfect in Christ. And so if you claim that, then back up that claim by telling me why you carry 50 pounds of fat on your midsection. You need to be prepared with a defense for that if you're going to carry that fat while claiming to be perfect in Christ. Tell me how that fat is being perfect in Christ. It shows to me a lack of self-control. It shows to me a lack of taking care of your body, a lack of respect for the temple the Lord has given you. So you're going to need to defend that. I personally couldn't do that because I believe that would be a sin for me because I know better. I believe that would grieve the Lord if I lacked self-control. I didn't do fasting. I didn't hold back many, many times when I'd like to have something to eat. I don't do it because I believe that it would be too fattening or it would be eating too much for the day. And so I say no to myself. I deny my flesh. But when you're putting 50 pounds of fat on your midsection, it's an indicator you're not saying no enough. Somebody offers you a treat, you say yes every time. If, if you have a craving, you give into it every time. If you want a burger, you eat the burger. If you want ice cream, you eat ice cream. Well, what if you already had ice cream and you want another bowl? Well, you're going to say yes and have the second bowl too. It's like, how many times are you saying yes to those cravings? If you're 50 pounds overweight, you're saying yes to those cravings way more than you should be. Start saying no more often. Paul says this, I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. We need to discipline our body. Our body is always going to be craving ice cream and junk food and chocolate. That's natural. But are you disciplining your body? Your body's going to want to stay up way past your bedtime. Your body's going to want to watch movies all day instead of working. Your body's going to want to... Um, okay, you're, <laughs> you're clipping Body Desk 2017. You're implying I'm being a hypocrite. Well, I have lost weight, and at the time, I was living in all kinds of sin. I wasn't even claiming to have stopped sinning. I claim that the past two years I've stopped sinning. So if I still had some kind of beer belly now, that'd be bad. But also in that video, I really wasn't um, obese. I probably was 15 to 17 pounds overweight. Which I would, stay, I would say is still within range of somebody that is still cares and is taking care of their body. At that time, um, I could still run a 8 minute mile, no problem. Um, still very, very healthy. And I, I started out this discussion showing some NFL players who had fat on them. Um... Well, yeah, in that clip also, I'm eating very healthy. Yeah, tons of vegetables and meat. So, yeah, I, I don't have a problem with that. Um, but 
So, so I'm saying not only was that not a sin, but it wasn't gluttony either, um, or nor was it um, har harming my health or self-harm. Okay, so back to what I was saying. Um, we have to discipline our body. Our body's going to want to do a lot of things. We have to say no. Now, I'm not saying every time you have to say no. So if you crave gyros with fries and a soda... Once in a while, if you're going out with some friends go, to go out to eat, yeah, you can have some fast food or whatever. But it shouldn't be an everyday thing. It should be with discretion, moderation. What does Solomon say about moderation? If you find honey, eat just enough. Too much of it and you will vomit. Okay, this can apply to gyros or chocolate or anything else that... There is a too much, and there is a just enough. So, sometimes you can have some honey or have some treat or whatever, but not every time you think of it. All right, let's read some verses about moderation. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert in sober mind and of sober mind so that you may pray. Another translation, the end of all things is at hand, therefore be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Self-controlled. So not just pigging out every single meal, Dairy Queen every single day, ten bowls of ice cream instead of one occasionally. The whole, please, I, let me finish. I know it's near time. Okay, well, let me wrap up. You need to get ready then and get her on the car. And, all right. First um, Corinthians fourteen forty, but everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. It should be done decently and in order, in a proper and orderly manner. So don't just pig out all the time or sit down and watch TV and eat like a huge bowl of caramel corn on a regular basis. Like you might have some favorite snack and you might eat a lot of it at times, here and there, but don't just do that all the time so that you become obese. You might love to just sit down and eat as much of a family pizza as you can fit in there. Okay, then do that like once every four months. The rest of the times, just have a little bit of pizza. It might be fun to see how much pizza you can eat and really just let loose at, at times. I think that's even okay occasionally, but not consistently. This shouldn't be the, the norm, especially if you're finding you're like 40 pounds overweight. It's like, okay... Now, you don't get to do that for a while. You know, reward yourself if you lose 20 pounds. Do it one time, but not all the time. As for you, always be sober-minded, or always keep a clear mind. Endure suffering. There is some suffering involved when you eat like a small portion of ice cream, and you're like, oh, that was so good. I've got to get another bowl. Like, i, I got to get a big bowl now. And you're like, no. You know, I'm, I'm a little on the fuller side. Of, you know, weight goes up and down. I'm on the higher end of where I want to be. I need to hold back right now because I'm starting to get a little chunky. It's, it's holiday season, whatever. I, I need to hold back. Well, there's some suffering there. You're denying yourself. You crave something and you're not doing it because... You're exercising self-control. And I believe that when you find yourself becoming more and more overweight, it's because you're not exercising self-control on a regular basis. You're forming habitual patterns of behavior where you're regularly going for that extra serving. You're having that huge scoop of peanut butter with your ice cream or with your, with your cereal instead of just a small amount or... You're getting a, a large Dr. Pepper with your meal when you could have just got a water. It's a series of decisions that lead up to that over time. Let your moderation be known unto all men. Pro Philippians 4 or 5. So practice moderation. Exercise self-control in, ev in everything. Endure hardship. Calmness, steadiness, and moderation in all things. You've got to moderate your eating, too. Moderate it. 
And that moderation, the fruit of that, will be a healthy body, a trim physique. You're proving you're not exercising moderation in all things when you have 50 pounds of fat on your midsection. You're not showing moderation there. You're not moderating your intake of calories, are you? No, you're excessively intaking calories to your own detriment. That's not moderation in all things. So it's very clear you're going against the sober, self-denying, putting the body under the Bible's talking about. You need to practice self-control. And so that's that's going to be my teaching on gluttony and obesity. That's that's my view of it based on what I've seen. And I believe that the Holy Spirit has shown this to me. But you may not have that opinion right now. Pray about it. Consider what I've said. All right, peace out, guys. i got to go to church.